Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our discussion today. We will be reviewing addressing stigma and harm reduction in a clinical setting. I am Jess Salstrom. I'm a family medicine physician and one of the associate medical directors at Terry Riley Health Services in Boise. Also, the I'm serving as the medical director of Idaho Harm Reduction Project, which is how I got connected to this North Idaho Substance Use Summit. Uh, today, I'm joined by Tess Reeser. Tess, if you want to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Tess Reeser, and I am a certified peer recovery coach supervisor, certified peer support specialist, a forensic uh, sorry, forensic support specialist, uh, harm reduction advocate, and director of operations at Kootenai Recovery Community Center. It's a mouthful. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so uh, just a couple of disclaimers for today. Um, obviously, this is for educational purposes. Um, we are uh, presenting information that's deemed to be true and correct as of today. If you're watching this recording in the far distant future, please access uh, any up-to-date resources you have. Um, and that this presentation was um, supported by and partially funded by um, a grant through the CDC. So many thanks to their work. For our goals and objectives today, we aim to recognize implicit bias as well as barriers to care that some of our friends may face. We'll review the continuum of treatment and recovery and all the stages in there. We will discuss methods of patient engagement as well as evaluation, go through a couple of substance specific harm reduction strategies and um, have a discussion about harm reduction techniques in the clinical setting. I uh, love this slide. It's um, brought to us through a group called the SAFE Project. Um, as a family medicine doctor um, or in any clinical setting that you are working in, we actually talk so much about harm reduction on a daily basis, um, hourly, minute by minute, right? We um, talk about harm reduction in a way of encouraging everyone who is riding a bike or um, other two-wheeled uh, adventure mobile to wear a helmet and or any other uh, safety equipment. We talk about um, uh, for individuals smoking tobacco, we say, hey, there's other harm reduction strategies. If you're um, interested in reducing your nicotine intake, for all of us driving cars, we use uh, safety belts uh, to help reduce harm, uh, speed limits in our neighborhoods, sunscreen for all of us uh, here in especially high desert summer. Uh, all of those are types of harm reduction. And so when we expand that further, thinking about substance use disorder, um, we think about syringe exchange, um, methadone, uh, medication-assisted treatment with Suboxone, having access to naloxone or other opioid reversals. Um, lots of things count as harm reduction. So we jump in. Uh, when we think about the core principles of harm reduction in general, our goals are to Think about how can we engage with the community and provide public health interventions that will minimize harmful effects of substance use. When we think about how do we partner with individuals in um, substance use uh, recovery or during their use, we used to think in previous models, gosh, we should only really work with folks who are absent from substances. That's how we know someone is ready for treatment. Um, but we have had a really big framework shift over the last few decades where we know that abstinence only is not going to work for every person or even in any specific stage of life. Um, and one of the best, most inclusive and open ways to partner with folks um, is that abstinence only should not be a requirement for services. Um, in general, our goal is to meet folks where they are and 
We have to recognize that reasons for substance use are beyond a person's control. And inside of uh, healthcare and substance use organizations, our goal is to expand access to non-judgmental, non-coercive services and resources, which overall, over many moons, uh, has been shown to improve healthcare outcomes for our patients and our communities. Every single day, we're working with patients to take steps towards healthy behaviors, um, and that starts with uh, meeting them where they are, which is really helpful. We as humans tend to have a really fascinating part of our wiring that makes us want to create categories. Um, we will think about um, a yes or no, an A or B, kind of that black and white uh, categorical thinking. That's actually a psychological predisposition and it's served us well over millennia. But when we think about compassionate care for our patients, it can sometimes pose barriers. So when we look at this um, drug and alcohol continuum, so many steps there, um, we think about, or I get to take a moment and say, gosh, if my perspective is just that there are people who are using drugs and people who are not using drugs um, or people who are abusing drugs and people who don't use drugs, we miss a whole host of individuals that need care. Um, so we, can we consider the spectrum of use. So in this visual, the progression of use to dependence is not inevitable. Depending on life circumstance, individuals can go back and forth between these stages. And at each stage, there are possible interventions. Um, and so I love, yeah, thinking about these definitions here and saying, how can I meet, again, someone where they are and make a difference in their trajectory to make sure um, they are meeting their health goals and getting to live the life um, in a wellness state that they're aiming for. Caring for folks in this spectrum does require that we recognize biases that we as providers bring to our care for patients. Um, so a little bit different over recording, but I'm gonna have us take a quick pause and do a mental exercise um, that will help us think about barriers and biases. So if we were to think about a country in the world that starts with the letter D, what's the first country that comes to your mind? So um, in general, some of us will have a natural tendency to think of Denmark because um, uh, of its location and potentially its prevalence in the news. Um, but actually there's a lot of countries that start with the letter D. We think about Dominica, the Democratic Republic of the Congo or DRC, uh, a nation by the name of Djibouti, uh, Dominican Republic, um, so there's a lot of reasons that most of us might have arrived at Denmark. Um, and that itself is an example of implicit bias regarding our geopolitical knowledge, schooling, where we live, all of those things. Um, so implicit bias is what we think we don't think um, is my easiest way that I uh, kind of view implicit bias. And so when we think about implicit bias, it's critical that we recognize, stay aware of, and learn to correct for the biases that we carry. Having biases doesn't make you a bad person, it makes you a human. Um, and so as we are trying to help and partner with folks who use substances, we have to address those um, implicit biases, um, which can span lots of different aspects of life. Um, and so these attitudes and beliefs can impact how we treat others. Um, it's really hard to recognize bias within yourself. So that's why we, um, try to build systems and, uh, dialogues within our uh, care provider communities to think about these. 
we can really believe in equity for all individuals, but unintentionally behave in ways that have bias and might discriminate. Uh, those things would include um, uh, changes based on uh, race, an individual's physical ability, their culture, language, gender, um, lots of these things. So uh, knowledge of implicit bias is empowering. It helps us uh, meet folks where they are and provide better care. We can uh, think about other barriers that patients might face when trying to access care. Uh, healthcare workers specifically um, might face a barrier, which is a lack of role models who are advocating for harm reduction in their communities. Uh, healthcare workers might also uh, always be looking for more education, might have a lack of mutual language, might experience fear. When um, we think about patients, they say, yeah, I wonder if in this clinic, their focus is on routines and check marks instead of caring about me as a person. And that can be a barrier to compassionate care. Um, there is countless stories, I'm sure all of you have experienced in this work where um, individuals can experience trauma related to healthcare. So um, not being treated as respectfully as they would have hoped or honestly deserve, um, or just having access to someone who can hear them um, and provide treatment strategies based on where in the treatment spectrum someone is. Again, all of uh, these barriers that we can think of kind of jogging our mind about things helps us create better paths forward for our patients. Um, and so in your communities, in your clinics, in your pods, wherever you're working, um, trying to think how would a patient accessing care in our group feel and how can we make this feel more inclusive or open or um, helping with those. So breaking this down, how do we apply this in a clinical setting? Uh, so we already have jumped on a couple of these, but really aiming for a patient-centered clinical experience. From the moment someone walks through the door, um, does someone feel at home, welcomed um, from the front desk all the way until they're seeing a provider? Um, and we also think about uh, being patient-centered in our language. So. In previous times, we used to say, oh, that person's an IV drug user when the most uh, helpful tool in our, our language, English, that I'm speaking to you today is that we know that words have power. And so if I were to change my phrasing, both with myself and with my staff members to say, it's not an IV drug user, that's a person who uses drugs or uses substances. Uh, we get to say, yeah, that, that's my person, that's my friend, uh, that's my patient. And so um, normalizing some of that part of language can be really helpful. Um, a lot of uh, application in a clinical setting is also getting comfortable with and familiar with um, getting to know an individual as well as their experiences and relationship with substances, being able to ask frank, clear, open-ended questions about different types of substances, um, and then viewing each person as an individual who has complex needs that extend beyond only the substance use, um, which is the amazing gift of, we get to work in a team. So um, I have folks who are facing, facing housing insecurity, food insecurity, have experiences of trauma, are struggling to find the right mental health treatments. And if we work on addressing each of those pieces, we have the potential to empower someone to feel ready to engage in additional substance use treatment options, um, counseling, um, get help with medications, all of those things. So again, yay, team-based approaches. And then when I think about inside of a visit itself, other than asking a really good history um, in a 
non-biased manner as best as I can. Uh, in every single visit, I'm trying to develop uh, what I always call is a needs hierarchy. So I come to every visit with a patient. I come in the door, someone's already sitting there. We meet in the middle and get to say, what's most important for us today? Um, and so I often have my two or three things. I'm really worried about your blood pressure, I'm really worried about your blood sugar. Um, from the patient perspective, they're really worried about affording their inhaler um, and all of those things. Substance use might not even be on the list of the initial things that we think about. And so we get the opportunity with every time we're meeting with an individual to say, okay, what's most important today? Um, and having ongoing conversations, letting someone know that you are, or I am a safe space to have these conversations. Um, it's not uncommon where I will say at the end of a visit, you know, while I think quitting any substance, alcohol, tobacco, opioids, meth, Kratom, all the things. Um, while I think quitting is um, going to be really important for your health and wellness, I know you need to be ready first. Um, would it be okay if we talked more about your substance use next time? Um, and honestly, just trying to keep those doors open, I think has been really helpful. So breaking that down even further, um, I did just include a couple of examples of phrasing. So again, words are power. Um, so inside of my interview, I will often, um, in the opener questions, will say things along the lines of, um, how would you describe your recreational drug use um, currently or like in the last month? I'll give a time frame. Um, and then if I'm asking about past use, I'll say, you know, what has using recreational substances looked like in the past for you? Um, and someone will be able to describe, oh, I use daily, monthly, weekly, and then I'll kind of get into the specifics there. And then when trying to assess someone's readiness for uh, treatment options, I'll say something along the lines of, do you think you want to continue using? Normally, I just say the substance by name, but here we use substances. And then um, that is in contrast to uh, taking a different tone and saying, you know, well, why do you want to keep using methamphetamines or why do you want to keep using heroin? Uh, changing our tone and kind of having that more open language is really helpful. Um, another question that I've found that's been really helpful is um, instead of saying, you know, why don't you have naloxone or don't you know how to keep yourself safe? Um, I'll start by saying, what steps do you need to take to keep yourself safe while using? Or I'll say, do you happen to have access um, to naloxone in case of an overdose of you or uh, someone that you're around. Inside of these conversations, um, other things that I think about is uh, at as many visits as I can, um, chatting with folks about uh, as many harm reduction principles as I can. Um, when we are uh, using all these open-ended questions. Again, I'll kind of run through and say, hey, is it okay if I ask a couple more questions about um, health risks that might be associated with your substance use? Or um, yeah, is it okay if we talk more about strategies to help keep yourself safe from overdose um, or things like that? Uh, inside of if someone is ready for testing treatment, getting connected with resources, I'll run through a couple of things around um, specifically fentanyl test strips have been really essential. Um, our Idaho Harm Reduction Project and a lot of other organizations in the state and region will be able to um, provide those fentanyl test strips for patients. Um, we'll go more into specifics in a little bit, but um, yeah, I'll talk about fentanyl test strips. So testing the substances that you're using to make sure you know what you're taking. Um, uh, on the other end of testing, kind of in the medical office side, I'll talk about uh, testing for bloodborne diseases, things like HIV and hepatitis C. Uh, some folks will say, oh no, I know I don't have that, or um, I don't wanna know if I have that, um, which, both are reasonable reactions to my questions. And I often just follow up if I can with, you know, more open-ended questions of like what makes
expand and all those things. But in a our short a lot of time, sometimes I'll just say, you know what, knowledge is power, and if we find this out, we can um, figure out a way through together. Um, so I think that's been helpful. Um, we'll talk about other STI testing. Another harm reduction strategy I try to loop into appointment visits is talking about wound care and prevention. So letting folks know what their resources are. Um, I never want a patient to feel like they have a skin issue related to an injection um, and that they don't know where to go. They're afraid to go to the ER. Um, yeah, so anyway, letting folks know. Um, and then talking about, yeah, appropriate skin care before and after injections. And then uh, we did not uh, a lot, a whole amount of time to talk about medication assisted treatment, but it is one really huge anchor point um, of all of our harm reduction strategies. Um, if a patient is ready and um, wanting to engage with harm reduction strategies via medication assisted treatment, I try to get folks plugged in as soon as possible, which jumps us into this uh, continuum of treatment and recovery. There's lots of different places where folks can access care, whether that's acute treatment services. So sometimes we use the euphemism detox. Um, there's other locations where individuals after acute detox can have a additional services to help in that kind of stabilization window. Sometimes we'll use the term rehab. Uh, there's other transitional support services, residential housing, um, and then longer term alcohol or drug-free homes, uh, kind of in the group setting, as well as outpatient services. And my, uh, yeah, anchor point, like we talked about, is that medication assisted treatment can be used at any time, uh, which is wonderful. In addition to medication assisted treatment services, uh, we can think about universal and substance specific harm reduction techniques. So I chatted briefly about um, fentanyl test strips. Uh, that's the end of that take home testing there. Um, at Idaho Harm Reduction and other um, organizations throughout the state, we can provide a safer injection supplies. So that not only includes access to clean syringes, but also uh, skin cleaning um, tools, as well as uh, aftercare, uh, gauze bandages, um, lots of things uh, can go into that. So belabor us with a Amazon order list. Um, one other huge part of harm reduction is the um, prescriptions for naloxone, which is an opioid uh, overdose reversal medication. I explain it to folks, um, actually anyone I prescribe opioids to, um, or even anyone who just wants it. I keep one in my car. Um, for Narcan kits, they have uh, nasal and intramuscular injection versions. Um, we think about opioids in a couple of ways. They work on uh, pain receptors in the body. Um, and one difficult potential side effect of any opioid is that the opioid can, for lack of a better phrasing, uh, become at a high concentration in the body or bind in a specific way to heart and lung nerves and cause the heart and lungs to stop working well. Um, then you have signs of overdose and um, having naloxone on hand for use for an individual suffering from opioid overdose will um, cause them to uh, release some of the opioids that are binding to the receptors and allow them to breathe and have better heart rhythms. Uh, that person should also receive CPR if necessary and emergency um, first responders should be called. Um, and we obviously uh, nationwide now get to have both um, providers and pharmacy prescriptions as well as nonprofit organizations that can provide naloxone uh, for yeah, individual community home use having it. So 
Um, there's a lot of other things listed here um, as far as harm reduction supplies. Uh, one thing that I've learned about in the past couple of years that I wanted to share that I really love are these two um, iPhone and uh, website based services called Never Use Alone, as well as the Canary app. Um, I have them both screenshotted here. They're both free um, and don't have too many pop-ups. Um, and the idea for both of these is to help um, individuals if they are going to use substances, um, specifically opioids because of the potential risk of heart and lung issues to basically share with someone anonymously or non-anonymously that they are using. Um, and there are prompts inside of both the phone call, the texting app on Never Use Alone, as well as the app for Canary. But there's kind of a timer. If you haven't um, responded within a certain amount of time, um, they'll send emergency medical attention or um, can even reach out to your emergency contact. So those have both been amazing resources for a lot of my patients. So thought I would share those. Yeah. Oh, my other favorite thing about the Never Use Alone is um, they their tagline is meeting people where they are on the other end of the line, one human connection at a time. Um, and I just think that's really cool. So we kind of in summary, um, thinking about all of these things, the goals of harm reduction in a clinical setting, as many as we can, we should aim to connect individuals to overdose education, um, counseling services about mental health or counseling services about substance use disorder. Um, as many connections as we can make um, is another life we can save. So um, we also think about referrals to treatment for substance use disorder. So um, thinking about medication assisted treatment, things like Suboxone or Methadone um, are yeah over and over again been shown to help promote healthy lives. Um, we, um, I'm always amazed, uh, obviously data is still coming out and being released by different community-based organizations. But when we think about the positive impacts of harm reduction, um, they're countless. We think about reducing overdoses, providing gateways for addiction treatment um, and reducing disease in general. So. Um, we know that all substances ha have health impacts and uh, helping someone transition, even I always say every day, like transitioning from four times a day use to three times a day use is still a win in my book. Um, and so when combined um, with kind of local resources and things like that, um, we also think about harm reduction as a um, as a way, um, and we've seen evidence of the decline in new HIV and decline in new hepatitis C infections. Um, we also see that harm reduction strategies in the local level uh, reduces drug use overall um, and also reduces discarded needles in open spaces, as well as improved overall health for people who use drugs and their families. Um, my other favorite part of life is getting to educate individuals um, who are at risk as well as bystanders. So um, I'm seeing a grandmother in clinic and she just happened to mention that um, her nephew um, struggles with substance use. And so I talked with her about the importance of having naloxone in her home. And um, she initially had a lot of questions and said, oh, like, I don't have opioids, so why would I need it? But um, getting to just expand community access and help folks have a bit of, sometimes in psychology, they use the word self-efficacy. So being able to view um, a way forward, getting to have the tools that you need to be successful to meet a goal. Um, so whether that's personal goals, community goals for um, friends, family. Um, and one other goal that we think about for harm reduction in a clinical setting is to reduce stigma overall. Um, stigma never serves us that well, it turns out. Um, and if we work on reducing the stigma that's associated with substance use disorder and co-occurring disorders, uh, whether that's reducing stigma 
again, with our front desk staff, um, other folks working on our team uh, can make a big difference in patients' willingness to engage with care, um, to follow up for other routine health screening stuff. Um, and overall, kind of our big umbrella is to just get to promote a philosophy of hope and healing um, by including individuals with lived experience who are along that continuum that we talked about. So engaging with individuals at every part of their journey. That kind of concludes the first part of our um, education session. Um, for our next portion, I was hoping to jump into um, kind of a conversation-based question and answer session um, with Tess. Um, so um, Tess, I'd love to know if you could share a little bit about how you got into this line of work and harm reduction specifically. Okay, how did I get into this line of work? <clears throat> it's kind of a personal experience, but that's kind of what I'm here for. So um, so I have a long line use, like I've used substances my whole life since I was probably about 13. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I didn't think that there was anything wrong with it. So I was, you know, older, had multiple DUIs. And in 2017, I um, was drinking and driving with substances on me and uh, totaled my car. Mm -hmm. And I could have you know, not only hurt myself very badly, but other people. And I kind of knew like I was needed to change, you know, um, I ended up getting sentenced to 15 years in prison, um, because of that ex wonderful experience actually, mm -hmm. um, you know, because I wouldn't be where I am today. Uh, without experiencing that. And I wouldn't be in the line of work that I am in today, you know, being able to use that experience that I've had to help others, you know, um, harm reduction to me, just because I know a lot of people, I love a lot of people that, you know, are still active and, um, and recovery is not their journey, you know, or at least it isn't right now. And so I'm always going to be that non-judgmental, very supportive friend, you know, that is always going to be there regardless. And, um, you know, I am going to do whatever I can to not only help them, but to help my community. And so that harm reduction model really fits in well with what we do, because we have individuals that are just not really ready, you know, to quit. And so teaming up with the harm reduction project here in Idaho, you know, we're able to have that stuff, you know, needles and, um, you know, the cleansing alcohol wipes and the needle disposals and all of that stuff and the, and the Narcan, you know, we, we have that here and readily available for individuals that need it or want it. And um, I, have the pleasure of like being able to talk with them on one-on-one -on -one to see where, you know, where they're at and they may or may not be in treatment at that time, you know, but we plant the seed of hope and, and strength and, and care and compassion and empathy, you know, to, to give them, um, you know, to work within that harm reduction model that is put in place. So does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. I love the way that you kind of, yeah, get to have such a unique view of saying, gosh, this was a really difficult thing, but really brought you to where you are. I think that's such a cool outlook to get to say, yeah, this was a really hard thing, um, but it really is kind of like, you know, that tragic thing that happens in your life that you get the opportunity to like turn it around and have, mm -hmm. you know, and triumph over it. You know, everybody loves the comeback. So it's, it's pretty cool. And I get to, I, we get to, you know, working in this field, get to see it in so many individuals. And it's so inspiring, you know, to, to hear people say, like, I didn't think I'd be where I am today 
you know, and have so much doubt. And it's like, man, you're amazing. Like you, you know, in a year's time, what a 180, you know, you went from like losing your kids and your house and, you know, not having a car. And then it's like, you have regained your whole life back in such a short period of time of trying, you know, working, working, whatever that recovery journey is to you, you know, but those are just some kind of off subject. Sorry. No, that's perfect. Yeah, that's the goal. Um, I, always, I always say there's no tangents. So um, I think that it's really interesting um, to get to be a part of basically like a really amazing sacred journey for a lot of folks, um, kind of walking through hard things with them um, and potentially yeah, seeing them to brighter days. Um, I guess um, I know my thoughts on this, but do you have specific ways that you feel like, um, are helpful to build trust with the folks that you work with? Yeah, I think, you know, it really comes down to like authenticity, you know, like really just being yourself and connecting with people that come through your door, you know, on, we're not friends, but you know, you can be friendly. You, you open that rapport. Like, you know, you're, I, when we have people come in here, it's like, you know, I always make sure that I have a smile on my face and say hello and give them that, like, you know, warmth, like being mm. warm and giving them that greeting, you know, because sometimes you just, if it's new and you've never been there before, how awkward, you know, how much anxiety it takes or to like reach out and ask people, you know, for help is not always the easiest thing to do. And, um, and if you don't, you know, it could be just that, that meeting, you know, where you're like, whoa, like that person was really off putting and didn't give me, you know, didn't make me feel welcome or wanted or, or didn't feel like they were being genuine, you know, it can be off putting and, and um, they may never come back, you know, so I want to make sure that everybody that comes through our doors that they want to be here and that they want to come back and they know that they're wanted. Yeah. Oh, I love that so much. Yeah. One. Um, yeah. I love that you said like, um, they're not friends, but we're going to treat them as friends. And um, I joke with my nurse all the time. I like have started. Uh, yeah. Just again, knowing how much power words have like at the end of a visit in a clinic setting, I always have to give someone a piece of paper, or, um, you know, they might need a lab test or something. And so instead of saying like, Oh, Jim in room four needs this. I've just started being like, Hey, um, our friend Jim needs, uh, this and this and this, and even just like, yeah, part of it is kind of silly. Um, even if it's my first time meeting someone, but it's kind of changed some of my like harder days when I'm just like, uh, I'm like, Oh, you know, this person and my nurse will be like, your friend. <laughs> so, um, and yeah. I think that's hard because, you know, like when, when I was becoming a peer support, you know, like for ethics training and, and stuff like mm -hmm. that, they're like, you know, like they're not your friends, but I mean, when you treat people like, you know, they are your friend, like you are, you're giving them something that they need. And in return, I mean, I get what I need when I, you know, I'm sitting with them as well. Like they help keep me sober. Um, I am, have five years coming up here on the 17th. So, um, you know, it's like they help me just as much as I try to help them. Totally. Yeah. It's just all about that human connection. So, um, are there a few things that for you have been helpful as far as like, staying resilient in this line of work or even over these last couple of trying years? Oh, you know, of course we talk a lot about self-care, you know, and so I think being active, mm -hmm. um, I've always had a really active lifestyle, but you know, nature to me and living in the Mecca of, you know, like being able to snowboard and swim and hike and fish and camp and boat and four wheel and motorcycle ride. You know, it's like, I, 
I really am kind of spoiled in that aspect. Um, so I get a lot of self-care in <laughs> family, um, you know, just spending time with family and, and, uh, it's kept me sane. My world was really small during COVID, mm-hmm. you know, it consisted of me and my husband and my kids pretty much, you know, cause everything else was shut down, but we were able to go out into the wilderness every weekend. And it felt like everything was normal. <laughs> right. Yeah. It turns out forests and lakes were not impacted by COVID. <laughs> yeah. Right. Either were oceans. Really. Yeah. Oceans, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah the cities were, but no. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's still good to us, thankfully. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I love that. Um, do you feel like, are there, um, specific things you would want to know you would want healthcare providers um, to know about maybe specifically individuals that use um, recreational drugs or use IV drugs yeah I mean I, there are you know I have I myself personally have been really lucky that to have really good positive experiences mm-hmm. um, you know with starting to use at the age of 13 and till I was like 38 was my length of, of use. And, but my doctor like delivered my mom and, you know, he was like an old school dude. And I would have thought, you know, like he would have been really kind of hard on me because I was a teenage mother. Mm -hmm. Um, I did, I quit using mostly during my pregnancy. Here's the harm reduction in this is that, you know, I smoked pot like during my pregnancy and he was so, and this was in 1996. This was a long time ago. Um, <laughs> and he, But he was an old school dude and he was so compassionate and so caring and you know, understanding that I never had an issue with him, but then I work with other mothers, you know, that have had negative experiences or people, you know, that really are like, I'm not going to the doctor. Like all of my experiences are, you know, and they would rather die than go seek medical care, you know? And it's like, that is so terrible. So what I want, you know, healthcare professionals to know is that that compassionate care is so important, you know, to look at every individual as if, you know, they're doing the best that they can. Mm -hmm. They're surviving in a world that is not very friendly, you know, and we see this in social media on a daily basis, how, how angry people are today you know, that there's a lack of compassion and care for people, you know, and to really like take a step back and to, to look at this person, like they're your sister or your brother or your mother or your father or your kids or somebody that is close to you so that you can give them the, I'm going to say love, you know, and attention, even though it's on a different scale, you know, but that compassion and that empathy that every human being deserves. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, yeah, I love that so much. Like, I don't know, we all do so much training and schooling and all of these things. And like, it's just amazing to think through like, what really matters is just being that person who's there, um, who what listens they and can provide strategies. Like just be kind, you know, that should be like our <laughs> motto for the next 10 years. Like just be kind, you know, to the person yeah. next to you. Yeah. We never know what, that, what somebody else is going through or what they've been through. Right. Yeah. All of the above. So, mm-hmm. I think that that's so beautiful and yeah I'm glad that you um, got to partner with such an amazing uh, provider through multiple generations that's really amazing so I love that yeah he was since Um, retired (laughs) (laughs) 
living good. So, um, yeah. And, um, I think even just thinking about harm reduction as a way of, yeah, providing a safe space for someone, you never know, like you said, someone might be willing to die or have like really intense illness or health outcomes and not seek medical care because they're worried about judgment, stigma, being treated poorly. And like, even just taking a moment to be kind, you never know what impact that could make the next time someone is um, sick or struggling with something. Like if you can be a safe space for someone to come with their concerns, like that alone could save a life, you know, or save a whole family. It's yeah. Well, and I also feel like the follow-up too, from that treatment, if the person does, you know, if they go in that follow-up is really important, you know, like making sure that that individual is okay, you know, like, like not being like, okay, we're done here. We've done what we've needed to do, but to like, you know, maybe a contact like a week or what, you know, whatever later down the road, not too far down the road, but to say, how are you, you know, yeah. to make it to where they're not just another person. And I know that's difficult because we're looking, you know, you're looking at people that have giant caseloads, you know, um, they have hundreds of patients to see. And so that, in, you know, in most practices, I would think like hundreds of patients to see, and that's a lot of people and, you know, that's a lot of follow-up, but just that follow-up is important because, you know, then they're not being forgotten. Mm -hmm. yeah. You get to kind of see where they're at, you know, and if they need continued care. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I think about that a ton. And, um, even in like, sometimes building an agenda for the next visit, just being like, I want you to come back because we still have some unfinished business. You know, we, we have to talk about this or I want to know how this, ha like how this goes. And, um, so even, yeah, actual follow-up depending on your <laughs> ability and staffing and all that stuff, or, um, at the end of the visit being like, I'm going to see you in two weeks, you know, whatever the time limit is. Um, yeah, I think it's a huge tool. So I love all of those things. Um, and then I always love to ask if there's a couple of things, maybe specifically for your community that you're living in, um, that you hope for, um, with regard to harm reduction in the next mm -hmm. year. Well, I really hope that our County gets on board, you know, it's, uh, I've had conversations, a lot of conversations. So what I would like to see and what I feel like is that, you know, our systems have become somewhat fragmented because there are so many, you know, little things happening out everywhere. And yeah. so to bring all of those together and to really like unite as a community to work with mental health and substance use, you know, bringing that whole you know, bringing it together um, and really utilizing the resources that we have. So we're not duplicating and, you know, this place can kind of grow with that and, and so on and so on. Um, that would be really nice. And that is kind of like one of my, you know, that I feel like I'm working on, but it just, it's a lot. Yeah. And then, you know, having the involvement from like, the county officials, you know, being in North Idaho, like we have five counties mm. to our region one, you know, so that's a lot of, it's a lot of healthcare that's not really happening in some of these smaller counties. And so that outreach really, I mean, to me, I think that that community outreach is so important in getting to those smaller communities and being able to help people, you know, that don't have the means to have transportation or the luxury to live in downtown Coeur d'Alene, you know, or have access to the resources that are available. So um, really like upping that community outreach and providing individuals with services kind of that are out there a little bit more, you know. 
Yeah. I I'm love fine. both of those. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like um, interesting to hear you phrase those because it seems like you're like, I want to dive deep and get us all connected. And I also want us to like disperse to the four winds. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just do all the things. But um, yeah, I was talking with um, Marjorie, who's our um, executive director for um, Idaho harm reduction. And, um, you know, for as many things that were hard about COVID pandemic life, um, one cool thing that we were thinking about is just, gosh, we were pushed to make creative solutions. And ironically, it sort of helped with access. Like Marjorie was saying like, yeah, two, three years ago, never in a million years would I think that our little downtown Boise office would be mailing thousands and thousands of syringes and Narcan kits north. And she was like, but that's a huge need. And we have this grant funding. And so why not send things to the mail when we can? So mm -hmm. um, it's and, been a yeah, godsend up here. Telehealth visits, like, you know, we spent three years trying to get telehealth visits at my work and then we did it in one week. We're just like, we have to do it. So um, creative solutions will continue to find us hopefully. <laughs> I love it. You know, that is the only good thing that came out of COVID really is that we have now been able to connect on a different level to where we can, you know, have these conversations and be able to, you know, spread that awareness and advocate and, you know, really get on like we're a big, big team now, you know, it's not like we're just stuck with a few individuals. Now we get to branch out and use the experiences of others to help guide and, um, and foster and nurture these amazing things that we want to do for our communities. So it's pretty exciting. Uh, so wrap up from here, but um, thank you all so much for listening and um, I wish you all the best in your journeys of partnering with individuals in their um, journeys towards recovery, um, as well as uh, partnering with folks in engaging with harm reduction. So um, I have our contact information here. Um, feel free to reach out um, with any questions or things we can help with. Um, if you're in the Boise area, let me know. <laughs> I love coffee. So, um, yeah, 